how did I actually get started on this project? Well, it really began with another book. Many of you may be familiar with it, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, about a 19, uh, an event in 1951 in which a 31-year-old, largely illiterate, very poor African-American woman named Henrietta Lacks was dying of cervical cancer. Doctors at Johns Hopkins took cells from her womb and they became a ubiquitous and hugely important tool in medical research. She was unaware of this, and the author of the book, Rebecca Skloot, spends a lot of time in the book examining the impact of that on her family who was left behind. And I just could not put that book down, like so many people, I'm sure. And so that book was foremost in my mind a couple of years later when I came acro across a letter to the editor of Science Magazine from someone called Leonard Hayflick. He identified himself as a scientist in California and said, basically in this letter, the HeLa cells are getting all the attention, the cells from Henrietta Lacks, but I derived some cells in 1962 from an aborted fetus, and they've been used to make vaccines that have protected hundreds of millions of people. And not only that, I got into a huge intellectual property fight with the NIH in the 1970s about just who owned those cells, and it raised questions that are still unanswered today. That letter just leapt off the page at me, and I very shortly thereafter phoned Leonard Hayflick he was 84 at the time. By the way, today, this very day, is his 90th, uh, 89th birthday, and he's still going strong. Um, but anyway, I phoned him. He said, I said, it sounds like there's an untold story here. And he said, is there ever? <laughs> and <laughs> shortly thereafter, I happened to have a college reunion in California, and I was able to visit him at his home in Northern California and hear the story of the WI-38 cells from the beginning. And what there he is uh, in uh, 2012 with his wife, Ruth, in the Sea Ranch, California. He took me back down memory lane to this place, the Wistar Institute, an elegant brownstone tucked on the University of Pennsylvania campus, but independent of it. It was sort of a creepy mausoleum of 19th century American anatomy with all these horrible anatomical specimens in the late 50s. And really was more abundant at a time when the man in the middle, Hilary Kaprowski, was recruited to give the institute a new life. He became its director. Hilary Kaprowski was a larger-than-life character, an erudite Polish emigre who had escaped from Hitler, you know, in the nick of time, uh, fled with his young family via South America to the States. He was an epicure, he was a polymath, he could quote Rambo as easily as he could discuss virology, he loved wine and women and song, not necessarily in that order, and he definitely looked down somewhat on American scientists as being just a bit colonial. And so when he hired the young Leonard Hayflick, who in this picture is about 30 years old, who was a working class Philadelphian who bought himself up by the bootstraps from a family that had nothing and worked his way through a PhD in medical microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania. Kaprowski, the czar of the Wistar, as it were, looked on Hayflick as a sort of a technician, s hired to serve up cells, dishes of cells for for experiments to the really outstanding biologists from all over the world that Kaprowski had by then recruited to the Wistar. Well, Hayflick was a very bright guy, dogged, ambitious, and he was not about to be made a second-class citizen or stopped from doing science. He wasn't just going to be a household servant. So what did he do? He began getting fetuses from abortions that were conducted across the street from the Wistar at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Now, abortion was a criminal offense in every U.S. state in this era. In Pennsylvania, there was not even an exception in the criminal law that it would be okay to do an abortion to save the life of the mother. You could get 10 years at hard labor, lots of fines. However, there was a parallel universe that operated where authorities looked aside from major medical centers like the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where if they could do a so-called medical therapeutic abortion justified by doctors for doctors' mysterious reasons, then they tolerated it. And so that's how Hayflick began to receive this flow of fetuses every few months, and he would grow the fetal cells in lab dishes. Now, it was an article of faith and belief in science at the time that if you grew cells in lab dishes, they should grow forever. They were immortal. And if for some reason they died, it was a screw-up on the part of the scientist. 
temperature hadn't been right in the incubation room or someone had sneezed on the cultures and infected them or the nutritious broth used to nourish the cells was somehow defic deficient. And so when Hayflick cells started dying after several months, first the cells from the first fetus he got started to get decrepit and then die, then the, the next one, then the next. He thought he was screwing up. He did all kinds of experiments. Why were these cells dying? What was he doing wrong? You can see on the left, those are young, healthy w uh, fetal cells from the lungs, typically of an aborted fetus. On the right, those are old, elderly, disorganized, and decrepit cells in their very last stages of life. Why were they dying? He finally saw what decades of scientists had not seen, that cells in lab dishes are as mortal as you or I provided that they are normal and not cancerous cells. Cancerous cells, by definition, will grow forever. But these are aborted fetal cells that were from healthy, normal fetuses, and they were dying, and he published a paper that said as much and took a huge amount of flack. That was 1961, but that paper made Hayflick's name. It took years and years for his finding to be accepted, but you talk to any young cell biologist today and mention Leonard Hayflick, and they will know of the Hayflick limit about 50 cell divisions that cells will go through before they die if they are normal cells in lab dishes.